So uh, we're here with uh, Yochai Ben Avi, and uh, who's the global policy director for Mozilla, uh, and Udbhav Tiwari, who's just joined Mozilla in India. Um, so, uh, Yochai, what what brings you to India? What's uh, what's interesting for you here, and what's Mozilla's interest in India? Certainly. So, um, great to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, you know, I first of all love coming to India, and it's great to be back. You know, I think. We started our work in India because our community asked us to. Um, we have, you know, the Mozilla Corporation, which I think most people know as the right. maker of their favorite browser, uh, hopefully. But, uh, you know, but we are actually, unlike some of our um, friends in industry, owned by a nonprofit foundation, the Mozilla Foundation. And so mm. we're driven by our mission, um, you know, that the internet is a global public resource, open and accessible to all. Right. Um, rather than um, just our sort of profits. And on top of that, you know, one of the ways that we're able to really sort of exceed in the market um, is because we have this global community of contributors. Um, and India is by far our largest community um, mm -hmm. of contributors around the world. And so several years ago, uh, when net neutrality and zero rating, um, you know, was a sort of a big issue, uh, obviously one that you were very involved <laughs> with. Uh, yes. and, you know, I think one of the one of the times we really we really got to get to know each other. Um, yeah. You know, is because our community asked us to get involved in that fight, um, and you know we've been continuing to engage. You know, in the Indian um, you know policy debates since then, hmm. um, and obviously uh, more recently we've been engaged around sort of privacy, data protection, um, and increasingly uh, also on on uh, connectivity issues and how do we sort of bring you know everyone online. So, what are some of the key policies that have defined? your work uh, globally uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, what have been your focus areas, what's what's shaping usage of the internet in, and what's shaping internet policy in the world right mm -hmm. now? So I think internet policy in general, but also in India is very dynamic right now. It's a, yeah. an exciting time to be doing this work. You, you, know, you, you, don't, are, you don't get much of a, uh, a break, do you? The mantra of our, our the policy team at Mozilla is never bored. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, I, th I think where that sort of shakes out to is sort of five big key global priorities. Um, the first is privacy and data protection. Okay. The second is sort of uh, intermediary liability and content regulation. Hmm. Um, the third is around sort of internet access and openness. Some days that's more net neutrality focused. Some days yeah. that's more um, connecting the unconnected. Hmm. Um, the fourth is around cybersecurity and the fifth is on competition policy. Okay, and uh, Udbhav, uh, you've been around in this space for a while, just joined Mozilla from Google. Uh, what are the themes that you're seeing emerging in India? Uh, I think that uh, at least over the last year, there have been two sort of distinct themes that have emerged with how the government is thinking about regulating the space. The first mm. is on data protection, where there is the draft data protection bill and the conversations that have been happening on uh, how to essentially bring uh, the Puttaswamy judgment that encapsulated the right to privacy being a fundamental right. Uh, yeah and ensure that Indian citizens and their data is as safe and as protected as possible. Okay. Uh, and the second is on content regulation, where the government is uh, looking at uh, reforming safe harbor and intermediary liability, the way that it operates uh, in India. Mm. And uh, as a part of that, there were draft rules that were issued late last year, and there was a public consultation as well. So those have been two of the, I think, sort of big issues that the government's been working on, along with uh, some stuff on uh, e-commerce that is a part of a broader trade narrative. So essentially e-commerce, there is uh, intermediate liability, there's content regulation, uh, and there's that big, big one of, of data privacy. Uh, Yokai, what do you think about data localization? How does that, uh, because that's been one of the hottest topics in India. Uh, what's Mozilla's view on mm -hmm. data localization and uh, how has it impacted, uh, you know, internet usage in, in, in countries where it has been implemented? Indonesia is one country, right? Mm -hmm. where, there is some form of data localization in place. So, you know, I think that in general, data localization is not good for users, businesses, or security, right? Um, you know, I think, especially when you have an environment like India where you have no privacy laws or no meaningful privacy laws right now. Yeah, we, we, we're, we're still waiting for that privacy law, you know. <laughs> it's been a you while. know, I think, I think there's a real, you know, danger yeah. sort of having your data forced to be stored, you know, in a jurisdiction where you don't have, you know, the sort of privacy protections. Yeah. I think that, you know, just the fact of storing data in a given country doesn't necessarily make it any more secure. Hmm. Um, you know, I think it increases, um, you know, 
risks from a security perspective because it sort of keeps all that data in one location that increases you know single point of failure the opportunity for compromise of that information um, and i think you know if you're a business you want to be able to sort of place you know, your data centers, place your data sort of in the most efficient way possible, right? Hmm. Um, when you have to sort of dis put data in a certain location um, that is not the sort of maximally efficient sort of place, um, you know, that can increase costs. There's not always the right infrastructure. Um, and so that can actually sort of hurt you as a business. Um, and obviously, that's not, I think, sort of in the interest of, you know, the government of India to sort of, it's part of the efforts to promote startups in India, businesses in India. Um, but you know, I mean, one counterpoint to that is there are Indian businesses that mm -hmm. are asking for data localization, for weakening encryption, because for them it means that uh, the national security of India is protected. You know, Indian uh, security agencies quite often complain about not getting access to data mm -hmm. uh, when they need it, and so localization seems to be one part of that remit. Uh, of, of that approach of getting access to that data. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's your take on, on, on the security issues around the world um, mm -hmm. and whether something like data, data localization addresses that those concerns? Uh, and of course, then there's a secondary uh, consideration of data being a national re natural resource. Uh, and some days they say it's the new oil, some days they say it's the new gold. Uh, so, so, so what's your so, take on both of those issues? So I think there's a, there's a lot of things there. I think, you know, there's a, an idea that, um, you know, data centers are like big business, right? Like data centers, like the average data center has like five jobs. Um, and so yeah. it doesn't actually employ that many, you know, people. Um, I think from a, you know, sure, is it easier for government to access data if it's held locally? Of course it is. Yeah. Um, I think we have to ask though, like, what are the protections around that data? Hmm. Um, and we shouldn't just see this in a vacuum of what's the easiest way for government to access the data, but sort of what's the right balance here, right? We need to have appropriate limits on government surveillance. Hmm. Um, and that conversation, frankly, is, is pretty nascent, I think, in the Indian um, context. Obviously, there have been sort of big stories around surveillance. There have been concerns around surveillance. Yeah. Um, but you know, should we be rushing headlong into unfettered, you know, total access to data um, without that sort of privacy protections, due process protections? I think that's a conversation worth having, and I think governments around the world are wrestling with this, hmm. um, and we see this, you know, in conversations around um, the Cloud Act in the United States. We see this around MLAT conversations. India has, you know, the longest average um, MLAT request time of any sort of the U.S. and India. Um, yeah. of any two countries in the world. Hmm. Um, and so I think that definitely says that something needs to change here. Um, that there but, is but do you think something needs to change globally? Can is there, is there a case for a global forum to decide on data sharing protocols across the globe, which is more easy because there are legitimate security concerns that exist? Mm -hmm. So I think that we already see some cooperation that happens at Interpol, that happens through police-to-police -police cooperation. Okay. Um, I think some of that data um, doesn't have all of the sort of procedural things that you need in order to, um, one, use that in prosecutions, which is different than getting access to data for intelligence purposes. Hmm. And uh, I think the other issue is that you have sometimes have conflict of law issues, right, where, you know, if you're the government of India trying to request information from um, a U.S. company, for example, ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, hmm. in many cases would prohibit a U.S. provider from turning that information over. Uh, is that a problem? It's a problem for, I think, the government of India in a lot of cases, and so I think that is something that we need to talk about and find better solutions for. Okay. Uh, Bob, what have you heard, what have you heard from uh, you know, the concerns of the government of India or from folks here today? Related to data localization, because that's a big, big, big topic right now. Uh, but also, it's largely it's also linked to this economic concern, uh, saying that if we have more data in India, then it helps uh, the development of uh, of AI in India. It helps uh, create a bit more capacity uh, for for uh, for improving governance. If let's say um, Google's asked to give traffic data to the Indian government, uh, what's what's what are you hearing? Uh, while I mean speaking as I think uh, the Mozilla's point of view on this fundamentally I think is that if one were to look at the policy objectives behind everything that you've mentioned the development of artificial intelligence economic development and the measures that the government is trying to carry out to achieve those policy objectives there's hmm. quite a gap between them 
Mm -hmm. uh, in order to develop, say, for example, let's take artificial intelligence, it's very important to fun fundamentally have sufficient knowledge capacity within the country in terms of trained software engineers, in terms of the like use cases and businesses willing to who understand the value of artificial intelligence and are willing to pay for those services much <coughs> before one would get to the questions of data and the training of algorithms. So on the economic argument of um, the development of local ecosystems, uh, uh, everything from corporate governance to taxation are all far more direct ways to incentivize economic development rather than taking the more longer route of trying to play with data. I think one thing that, that we're working on that might be interesting here is, uh, is Project Common Voice, right? which is a way of trying to build a very large body of data that can be used to power sort of a next generation of you know, AI. Um, so let's back up for a second. What is Common Voice? You know, so mm -hmm. This starts with the idea that voice technology, we believe, is a critical next generation interface, right? So whether that's um, high-end technologies like AR and VR, or voice assistants, or um, technologies that are geared for people with disabilities, um, and indeed, like I think voice can be super powerful for people with limited literacy. Yeah. If you want to build you know, a voice interface today into your app or your site, mm. some kind of service, um, you can pay Google money, you can pay you know, Amazon money, I guess you could pay Microsoft money, um, but these are very expensive data sets because it takes really large labeled data sets in order to build that kind of, train that kind of algorithm, build that kind of algorithm, right? That's that sort of challenge that you were alluding to of like how do you get the data you know, to sort of spur this kind of AI innovation. But the data sets that you can buy commercially from those large you know, handful of companies hmm tend to be um, in dominant languages, you know, they're in English and Mandarin and French and Spanish. Um, they certainly don't cover the full diversity of uh, alien languages that we see in India. Hmm. And that's not really in the roadmap either. Um, <coughs> and they mostly tend to be focused on um, the sort of uh, mail announcer, news announcer voices. That's where a lot of that data comes from. Right. So what we're trying to do with Common Voice, and this is today the largest repository of voice data in the world and it's all open source it's free to use and we've open sourced the data um, the algorithms and the models so that way people can take this and build this hmm. um, and you know we are committed to embracing sort of a real diversity of languages of accents of dialects of male and female voices and so um, the way this works is it's crowdsourced and it's very sort of in the spirit of an open source project people are donating their voices yeah um, to you know this database, and then two people verify that, so to make sure you don't have like a joker, you know, who's sort of saying something inappropriate on the recording. Yeah, um, and that's sort of building this corpus of voice data that anyone can use. So you know, this is um, quite timely because just yesterday I was at a discussion where some of these issues were being discussed, and um, uh, one, <coughs> one of the things that. Uh, a government rep was saying was that you know uh, give it another year or a couple of years and both both Siri and Alexa will be and and also the Google Assistant will be way ahead of anything that India can actually do and it's because they have access to that data but to, can you can, can you address this idea that more data needs leads to better AI because that seems to be the uh, the, the the thinking around the Indian government pushing for more data in India and it also leads to uh, actually um, them wanting to make a, create a framework it seems where uh, businesses and companies have to mandatorily give data uh, to either the Indian government or to, um, uh, to Indian companies under mm -hmm. something like a compulsory licensing or a statutory mm -hmm. licensing regime like it, that exists in pharmaceuticals or, or, or in music in India. Mm -hmm. So is there any credence to this idea that that more data leads to better AI. I think that's sort of a truism, right? Like, yes, you need large data sets mm -hmm. to um, to build most, you know, algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that you need to be pretty targeted, right? Like, just more data in general doesn't actually help you build a specific application. So I think it's worth thinking through what are the particular types of technologies that we want to see developed, mm -hmm. what are the particular types of you know AI use cases, mm -hmm. and then go out and sort of see where that data might be available and sort of how to encourage and incentivize that. Um, I think it's also important to remember that the government of India is probably the largest data collector in the country. Uh, and so I think there may be opportunities. Among, amongst the largest in the yeah. world if you take into account Aadhaar. 
For sure. And so I think there are some interesting questions around how do you, you know, how can government of India maybe make some data sets available? Hmm. Um, you know, I think there are efforts like Common Voice that we were just talking about that are trying to make large data sets, you know, available on an open source basis. Hmm. Um, and so how could you incentivize or collaborate to create sort of data sets like that? Hmm. Um, but that feels to me very different than sort of forcing a company to turn over, you know, private information um, to the government, to an Indian firm, or any firm for that matter. Um, and I think we need to be very thoughtful about that and sort of making sure that, you know, we're still keeping that primacy of privacy, you hmm. know, which is a fundamental right. Um, there's probably a lot of data out there that can be useful for building next generation technologies and new applications and new algorithms uh, that doesn't require sort of invading people's individual privacy and security. Okay, so one last question: What what are what do you think should be India's between you know, Udbhav and Yokai? What do you what do you think should be India's priorities when it comes to tech policy over the next couple of years, or at least over the next year? Uh, I uh, definitely think that uh, making sure that uh, the the process of coming up with regulation for the technology sector uh, could be more consultative, more public, and take into inputs from stakeholders as at as many stages as possible. Right. So if you look at the data protection, uh, well, we still don't have public submissions. Uh, I mean, the submissions haven't been made public. Uh, similarly, for the e-commerce policy, the submissions haven't been made public. So okay, transparency is one, yeah. and and due processes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, I think alongside that, I, uh, uh, the sort of frontier and emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, such as blockchain mm. and some of the other areas that different uh, aspects of the Indian government are thinking of regulating are technologies that are horizontal in nature. They tend to impact multiple industries at the same time. And it's mm. really important to make sure that there's consistency between the different regulations that different regulators are coming up with in India and are utilizing these technologies as well. And mm. the need for that horizontal consistency, uh, for example, is best exemplified in why we need a strong data protection law. That if we have a strong data protection law right at the top that guarantees the fundamental right to privacy for citizens, mm. then say if the Reserve Bank of India were to come up on guidelines on what can or cannot be done with data, and the fact that there would be a data protection authority to help guide that process will automatically make sectoral regulation stronger as well. Okay. Uh, any other priorities that you would? Uh, I no, just these two. So well, so substantively, in terms of our policy issues. Sure. So in terms of uh, policy issues, I would definitely think that on the data protection bill, our fundamental priority is going to be to ask that a law be passed, hmm. uh, and that uh, and that it come into force as soon as reasonably possible, while accounting for the various comments that have come in from all stakeholders. Uh, across the board okay. uh, on content regulation, like we wrote a letter to uh, Ravi Shankar Prasad mm -hmm. uh, with Wikimedia and GitHub uh, mm -hmm. talking about the impact that at least that draft of rules would have on the ability of uh, international companies and uh, uh, to be able to operate in India. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it'll be a key priority to make for us to make sure that the internet remains an open and accessible space. Uh, by making sure that safe harbor uh, continues to remain an effective way. Uh, Sa safe harbor doesn't look like it's going to last, mm -hmm. right? It, it, maybe a couple of years mm -hmm. uh, for safe harbor, maybe. I mean, just the way that the policies are shaping up, and it seems that a lot of the arguments around big tech uh, are impacting safe harbor. Um, how does how does uh, how does Mozilla sort of participate in that debate and? Uh, what do you think needs to be done? Because every government is looking at regulating big tech. Okay. So I think, you know, on one hand... Mozilla's big tech, right? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that on one hand, intermediary liabilities have been critical to making the internet um, what it is and to be. I've been a success to date. And that's mm. like for better and for worse, right? Like there's some really great things about the internet yeah. uh, and there's some really challenging things about the internet today. And I think that's the sort of the other hand is to say, you know, there are some real pressures today, right? We are seeing real challenges, I think, from difficult types of content, difficult mm. types of speech that really are sort of making us question something, you know, ought to be done is a very common feeling. Um, and the question is like, so what, right? Like what is, what is that thing that should be done? And I think the way that we've been thinking about this has been around 
um, you know, can we evolve the law in some respects to sort of place a greater sort of duty of diligence, um, mm. you know, around certain actors, right? Where we're talking about sort of process forms. Think about this in the way we think about data protection law, um, yeah. at, at least outside of India. Uh, and this is in the Indian draft law as well. But, um, you know, we, we talk about a risk-based approach in data mm. protection, right? You know, that sort of if you're handling particularly sensitive information or if you are, um, you know, dealing with at-risk individuals or some other sort of risk factor that you have to sort of do more things procedurally to mm. safeguard that data. Um, and I think in the same way, we might be able to envision some kind of regulatory framework that sort of says if you have sort of high risk sort of markers, then maybe there should be more procedural safeguards, more sort of required of you as an intermediary. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of responds to the actual risk rather than sort of trying to lump all intermediaries together or say that everyone's sort of the same and sort of obscures the sort of um, differences mm. in business models. And so can we sort of think about that kind of risk-based approach and the procedure side that would be required rather than sort of saying, you know, this type of content or that type of content or one hour takedowns or 24 hour takedowns um, and then sort of thinking about sort of those legislating for outcomes rather than legislating for process. Okay, and is that is that something that you're seeing uh, other countries grapple with as well right now? So I think this is very much a, an issue around the world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we, we see these debates playing out in the United States. We see them playing out in the EU. I've spent a significant amount of time in East Africa this year where we're sort of seeing these kind of conversations. Um, the EU is probably... Um, probably moving the fastest on this. Um, mm. So we'll see, we see that sort of already with the Digital Services Act that's um, probably gonna be proposed by this incoming commission, mm. um, sort of already sort of swirling. So the the safe harbors that you alluded to, Nickel, that um, you know in the EU are called the e-commerce directive. Yeah. Uh, and so I think for the first time in years, the European Union is gonna seriously consider sort of revising and revisiting um, the e-commerce directive uh, through the Digital Services Act. Okay. Well, uh, tricky times for the internet, and uh, <laughs> no doubt. And uh, it takes, it'll take the, the the rest of the world that wants a free and open internet, uh, or those people in the world who want a free and open internet to push back uh, against tricky policies that are hitting us. These are there are no easy answers, and that's what makes uh, the space really, really interesting. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank all you. the best with birth. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr.